So here we are. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first five verses. I'm going to give to you an introduction to help you, if you haven't been with us up to this point, for example, to kind of understand where we're at here in chapter 14. So I normally will give a bit of an introduction so that you may know its context, and then we'll move into the five verses of chapter 14. So we'll begin by reading. So I'll read verses 1 through 5, and then we'll get into our study. Revelation chapter 14. Beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. John writes, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps, they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures, the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And so when we looked at chapter 12, I mentioned to you that chapters 12 through 14 give us a deeper look into chapters we already had looked at. It gives us a deeper look at chapters 6 through 11. And so, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm going to give a brief review of some of the events that we've already seen. You see, in chapter 6, we have the pictures of what is, a picture of what is called the seal judgments. And in chapter 6, we saw six of these seals opened. And when the seals were opened, we saw a series of judgments that were poured out on the world. In that chapter, we're introduced to the Antichrist, we're introduced to war and to famine, to pestilence and natural disasters. You see, when the world goes through these cataclysmic events, we saw that millions will die. We also saw that sin will become an unchecked way of life, inspired and energized by Satan and demonic forces. We saw that when the sixth seal was opened, nature itself exploded with activity. The mother of all earthquakes brought terror upon people. It's the greatest earthquake the world had ever seen, and disasters began to follow swiftly. The sun became black, the moon as blood, the stars of heaven fall like ripe figs. Heaven departs as a scroll, every mountain and island move. The sun is blackened, the moon becomes as blood. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, mighty men, all of them are in terror. But instead of repenting, they actually are hardened in their sin. They begin to pray to the mountains. They pray to nature to be their help instead of praying to the God of nature. And then they pray for death, failing to realize that they will stand before the judge of the whole earth. So after chapter 6, we entered into chapter 7. And in chapter 7, we were introduced to 144,000. The 144,000 represent the godly remnant of Israel during the tribulation. And these believers survived the seal, the trumpet, and bowl judgments that come upon the earth. They also are the ones who survived the persecution, the wars, the famines, the natural disasters, the diseases, and the unleashed evil. When we got to chapter 12, chapter 12 revealed Satan's attempt to circumvent the work of Jesus Christ in salvation. It gave us an overview of his attempt to resist God's ultimate judgment. In chapter 12, we saw that the nation of Israel was represented as a woman. Satan was revealed as a fiery red dragon. Jesus, the male child born to the woman. The remnant seed of the woman represented saved Jews. And Michael was shown battling the devil. By the time we got to chapter 13, we were introduced to the Antichrist and false prophet. So the chapter revealed a false prophet who would be Antichrist, John the Baptist. 
The prophet, that false prophet, deceives people. He deceives them into giving their allegiance to the devil. They will be followers of the devil as they yield to the Antichrist. He's going to use counterfeit miracles and will make an image of the beast that appears to be alive. And so the image is referred to as the abomination that causes desolation. It's going to be built in the temple, in the middle of the tribulation. When Paul was writing about this, he said in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, that he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Well, Jesus spoke of this when he was teaching his men concerning last days. In Matthew 24, 15 and 16, he said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee, flee to the mountains. In Matthew 24, 21, it says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So that brings us to chapter 14. And the chapter we're going to be looking at is revealing what would be called the ultimate victory of Jesus Christ. It's going to give us a panoramic view of the tribulation from the standpoint of the victory of Jesus Christ. And this chapter has been called a preview of coming attractions. So these verses contain a prophetic view of Christ's ultimate triumph as well as his return to the earth. They reveal the beginning of his thousand-year reign at the end of the tribulation called the millennium, and they also preview his second coming. Now, this material that we're looking at is not placed in a chronological order. It's really what is called a prophetic overview. The chapter begins with Jesus standing on Mount Zion with his followers, and that occurs after his second coming, concluding with a pronouncement of judgment. And so that's your background or that's your context. We can begin now by looking at verse 1. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. John writes, I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. So he says, I looked, and behold. So when he says, behold, that, that gives us insight into the wonder that he's experiencing as he sees this, because he's seeing the lamb. The seen the, he has seen the lamb who is the king, and the king is standing on Mount Zion. When you read your Psalms in Psalm, uh, Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9, it reads, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. He sees the lamb, the lamb who's the king. He's standing on Mount Zion. We know the lamb is Jesus Christ because he is called in the Bible the lamb of God. And notice he's revealed as standing on Mount Zion with his 144,000 evangelists. Now, this is not a picture of heaven. This is a picture of earth after his triumph when he returns. We know this because Mount Zion is an actual mountain on earth in Israel. It's an actual mountain. When you go to Israel or when you even look at a map of Israel, you'll see that there are various elevated sites that are called mountains. To us here in California, they really don't appear to be mountains. They're not that high, but they're called mountains there in Israel. And so there's Mount Hermon, there's Mount Gilboa, there's Mount Tabor, Mount Carmel, Mount Gerizim. There's also a place called the Mount of Olives. Well, Mount Zion is a mountain, but it's also known as Jerusalem. And it's the, the place where the king will reign from. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, it says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. 
nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So the location is on earth, the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their forehead. Now these are the evangelists we were introduced to in chapter 7. Notice how it says in verse 1, these believers had his father's name written on their foreheads. In Revelation 7, 3 and 4, it says, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So these are Jewish believers. And these are believers who are protected throughout what is called the tribulation. In Revelation 9, 4, it said, They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So these witnesses that we're looking at are protected by God under the most intense persecution in history. These are on fire evangelists. They're afraid of nothing. They defy Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. And they preach the gospel fearlessly in the most terrible time in history they have no fear because God is protecting them. These witnesses are protected by him. And you can know, by the way, by way of application, that God protects you too. Maybe not in the identical way, but when you're out there speaking the word of the Lord and sharing the faith of Christ, God is with you in a very special way. And these witnesses are protected by the Lord. Notice how it says in verse 1, they have his father's name written on their foreheads. The unbelieving world has the mark of the beast, but these people have God's mark. And that gives them courage, courage to preach, even when their deaths are so intensely desired. Now that reminds me of something Jesus said to the 70 evangelists that he sent out to preach. It's recorded in, in Luke 10, verse 19. He was speaking and he said, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So they go forth and they have his protection and they confront sin and they're calling people to repentance. They're calling people to faith in Jesus Christ and they're declaring that what you're going through is the judgment of God. And they do so fearlessly because God is with them. Now that's something we see in the Old Testament when God was calling a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 through 8, it says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, oh Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth for you shall go to all to whom I send you and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Then he goes on to say, do not be afraid of their faces, because they're ugly. No, do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. That, that phrase, do not be afraid of their faces, you know, to me, it always strikes a bit of humor. But the fact is that whenever you preach the gospel, and there's been times when I've, I've shared with a group of people that, that really didn't believe in Christ, that you can be intimidated by the way they're looking at you, by the way they're responding to you. And sometimes when you're speaking to people, they're all receptive and they're saying, yes, this is good. I want to know this. And sometimes, some of you know this, when you're speaking, there's really a group of people who are, are wanting to confront you or get upset with you or say things to you. I've had that happen. I had that happen when I first got saved. I was told, go out and share your faith. And so I went with a friend of mine. We went to the library in Norwalk. I had, I had uh, a book in my possession. It was uh, a book, uh, uh, The Lord of the Rings. And, uh, and I had gone to the library and I had stolen the book as a non-believer. And I read it. And then I realized oh, you don't steal books from the library. I, so I brought it back. Well, actually, I told my friend George, I said, you know, I, I didn't check out a book that I have in my possession. I probably ought to give it back. And he said, that would be a good idea. And so he and I went to the Nor Norwalk Library and, and uh, I brought the book in and I I gave it back, and, and as we were walking out, there were a group of young people out there, and remember, I was young at that time, I was 20 years old, and George was 19. 
and there were three or four young people, and we came, and he said, let's go tell them about Jesus. You know, now, I'm a brand-new Christian. I don't know anything about street witnessing or sharing, and I was very intimidated, and I still remember standing there and speaking to these kids, and, and I didn't have much to say, but George knew a little bit more. He was my elder. He'd been saved for six months longer than me, so he knew the Bible backwards and forwards in Greek and Hebrew. I mean, it was amazing. And so I still remember the sense of intimidation that, that I felt. Even though the Holy Spirit had, 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 had filled me, and even though I was learning about Jesus, I had a testimony, I still remember how difficult it was to speak to a group of people who began to mock us as we spoke. But the Word of God says, do not be afraid of their faces. Give them the truth and share with them what Jesus has to say. And these people would do that. And, and Jeremiah was told, don't be afraid. Go out. They're going to look at you in a certain way. They're going to act in a certain way. But tell them the truth. And that's what he did. And that's what we do. And that's what these evangelists did. And they were protected by God as they did that. You see, when you know the Lord is with you and watching over you, you do speak fearlessly. And these evangelists are protected. They speak boldly in the face of persecution. These are those who will not die in the tribulation. They enter into the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ as living men. And they spoke, and they spoke with a confidence because they knew that the Lord was with them. When I was in college and I went through a particular class and the teacher said to us, every one of you in this class is going to need to, to take a few minutes. I'm going to give you a few minutes, each one of you, and I'm going to give you a word. I'll assign a word to you. And when I assign that word to you, I'm going to give you five minutes to basically speak on that word. Whatever that word is, uh, you will speak on that subject. And so I was there, and I'm quiet in class, you know, unless given opportunity. And so as I'm in class, it's after a few people have already gone up to speak over the weeks. The professor, that's when he looked at me, and he said, David, it's your turn. You come up. And I remember standing in front of a class. It was at Rio Hondo College, junior college. And I remember standing up in the front of the class, and there was about 25 students, fellow students. And so they were really peers. You know, they weren't much younger than me or at the same age as I. And I still remember, you know, that's intimidating. And, the, and the, um, the professor said, the word I'm giving to you is freedom. I said, you want me to speak on freedom? And he said, speak on the word freedom. I said, all right. And so I looked at him, and I said, when you use the word freedom, and I still remember some of what I said, when you use the word freedom, the word freedom usually speaks of being, um, being free from bondage or jail or something of that, in that way. I said, but the, the Bible teach of, teaches of freedom. And the Bible teaches that, that if a person sins, he's a slave to sin. But Jesus Christ said that he, by his word, would set the captive free. Jesus said, if you know my truth, I will set you free. And so there are people in this room right now who are in bondage. And you need to be set free. And you can be set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there was one girl in the class who is a Christian, and all of a sudden I hear one girl out of the 30 yell, Amen, hallelujah. So I, that's how I knew there was another believer in there. You see, when the Holy Spirit is with you, right? When the Holy Spirit is filling you, when you know what you have to say is true, when you know that it'll break the bondage of people, when you love them enough to speak the truth, that's what you do. And God is with you. You don't have to be afraid. Now, have wisdom. I mean, if they pull out a shotgun, it's time to walk away. But until that moment, unless you want to go to heaven quicker, until that moment, speak with courage and boldness. I've had people say, where do you get your boldness from? I get my boldness from the power of the Holy Spirit, the same source you have, the same source we have. I just believe this is true. I just believe that God will do what he says. And I believe that the message that God has given to us is to be given to mankind, and therefore, we have that responsibility. And don't be afraid of their faces. Find the opportunity to speak and watch what God will do. Well, he says in verse 1, having their father's name written on their foreheads. They have the father's name written on their foreheads, but the rest have the mark of the beast. And that reminds us that they belong to God in contrast to the mark that unbelievers receive. Now, these believers are protected by God. God welcomes them into his kingdom. And the joy of entering into God's kingdom is a joy that we believers can also share. And no, we do not sing their song. Their song is for them. These are the tribulation saints who came through the tribulation. 
They have their song. But we also have a song that God has given to us, a song of joy and a song of gladness. In first service, I had a surprise today. People showed up. And beyond that, <laughs> I was standing in the front before church started, and somebody walks up the center aisle to say hello to me, and I look at him, and he says to me, how you doing? And I said, I'm doing great. And he says, you don't recognize me, do you? And I said, I do, but I don't. <laughs> I said, I do, but I don't. I had just seen a picture of somebody who was in one of our worship teams, and I haven't seen him for a long time, just before I came out. So I thought, well, perhaps this is somebody who's been in the church a long time ago. That's where your mind goes. I'm trying to locate him. And he says, David, I'm Harold. And I looked at him. Harold. He was here for a service sitting in the front row. So I said, you don't mind if I kind of mark you for a moment, do you? And it doesn't matter. I'm going to. And so <laughs> I've known him since I was 14, 56 years I've known Harold. Harold and I went to high school together. But Harold and I also went someplace else together. <laughs> Jail. <laughs> because when I was 18, I decided to steal some jewelry from Hudson's Jewels in a mall in Whittier. So I went to a liquor store right across from the Taco Bell significant place and I stole a half gallon of Seagram 7 because I used to steal a lot so I stole a half gallon we went to a friend's house and drank I waited till he was nice and drunk and then I said I got an idea let's go rob a jewelry store okay why not so he and I it was night we drove and I took a tire iron and I broke a, a, a window in the Hudson's Jewels, we stole a lot of diamond rings and took off and we escaped the law for about six minutes. <laughs> we got arrested and put in jail in Whittier, in Uptown Whittier, in the Whittier Jail. And we were a little boozed up. You know, we were kids. I was 18. He was 18. I still remember I brought this up. He had forgotten some of this. I brought this up. I still remember him looking at me and saying, hey, let's sing. So we sang Jailhouse Rock. In the morning, it was an 8 by 10. In the morning, he said, I need exercise. Let's run around the cell. So we thought it was a real joke for a while, but we did a whole night in jail together. And I, I was sharing in, in our service today about some of the things that the Lord had done. And then I look at my friend, and I'm thinking that this is a guy that remembers some of the things that used to happen in my life. And so in the back, he, I visited with him for a while after service, and, and Harold says, you know, Dave, some of the things that you remember, he says, I've forgotten. You see, he became a fire captain. He was a fire captain for the Whittier uh, Fire Department and ended up in Huntington Beach as a fire captain, right? And, and here I am as a pastor, and, and I said, man, God has a way of having a sense of humor because look at you, a fire captain, and me, a pastor, and we're both in, in, the, in the business of keeping people out of fire, <laughs> That's what we do. I actually didn't say that. I just pretended I did. But anyway, because <laughs> I'm not a liar. But he was busting up, man. And I was, we were saying, look at how good God is. But this is the thing I wanted to say to you. Because just a moment ago, just before he left, and we, we'll be getting together again soon, he said, David, he said, there's something about you. I haven't seen him for 30-some years, easily over 30-some years, maybe 40 years, haven't seen him. He says, you have a joy. He said, you have a joy. There's something about you. You've got a joy. Yes, it's called the joy of salvation. My sins have been washed away. You can have, you can have joy, and that's what we have. You see, that's something we can have. We're protected by God. 
He welcomes us into his kingdom. And the joy of entering into God's kingdom is a joy that we have. In John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. In Jude 24, God is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. In Romans 8, 38 and 39, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have his protection, and he ushers us into his kingdom, and it gives us great joy. And these people had the joy of God. He protected them as they preached and proclaimed, we are cared for by God, and one day he will welcome us into his kingdom. And that gives me great joy. And so the father's name is written on their forehead. The others had the mark of the beast, but they're marked by their father. In verse 2, I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn that song except 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So he says, I heard a voice from heaven. Notice like the voice of many waters. John hears the voice. And what it seems to be is the combined voices of the 144,000. Now, we've already seen in heaven that it's a place of, of, of loud worship and praise. We saw in Revelation 5, 11 and 12, how John said, I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So we've already seen the combined voices declared to be a voice. And that's what we have here. The 144,000 worshiping God in harmony and it sounds so loud. You see in verse 2, harpists were playing harps. I'm not quite sure about that. I'm not into harps. But I've heard them played, and I've heard them played skillfully. And when someone can play a harp skillfully, it actually is, the word would be ethereal. It's, 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 it's uh, heavenly, heavenly. It's got a beautiful sound to it, otherworldly, if you will. And, and the harp can have a beautiful sound. And, and so these are plain harps. So it speaks of be uh, the beauty of uh, music played skillfully. And the voice that he hears is not crying out judgment. It's a voice of worship, a voice of praise. And again, heaven is a place filled with song and praise to the Lord. You see, in the reference to the harp speaks of singing praise to the Lord on a stringed instrument. Psalm 33, 2 says, praise the Lord with a harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of 10 strings. Psalm 98, verse 5 says, sing to the Lord with a harp, with a harp and the sound of a psalm. And so they're singing in a beautiful voice, worship and praise, and they're singing a new song before the throne, the living creatures and all. It's, it's their song. It's their song of redemption. It's their song, one that they can sing, and I'll show you something in a moment about that. But I, I, I asked Jared today to, to do the song that we did just before I came to teach the brand new song because that, that's a song that I first heard when I was first saved. And it just brings me back to that, that time when the, the, the group, the love song, would sing that. And the line that, that stands out is, a, is a, a line that has meant something to me in my own life when it says, sing a song of love, sing a song of gladness. But he goes on to say, much too long our music has been filled with sadness. Much too long our music has been filled with sadness. Now, we who are, are older have a longer history that we can look back on. And we can look back sometimes with nostalgia and sentiment the songs that we grew up listening to. Songs that weren't, they weren't always great songs. Some of them were pretty stupid. 
but a lot of the songs were beautiful, poetic, well-written. But many of the songs that I grew up liking were sad. And my wife, Marie, and I, just yesterday, we somehow I came across something, I forget exactly where it was online, and I, I forget if it was part of the feed or whatever it must have been, but it, it said these are the 100 songs that were from the 60s. So Marie and I both being from the 60s, I said, let's see if we know these songs. And they weren't the whole, all the song. It was just, just a little of each song. And so there were 100 of them. And so I just started playing the songs one at a time. And she and I knew most of the, most of the words to all of these songs that we listened to. Now, I didn't listen to 100 songs. I listened to 10 or 12, just, just like I said. And I, I, it amazed me that you know, this is 50 years plus ago, we still remember the words of these songs. And, and the words of the songs, many of those songs were sad. They were sad songs. You know, my, you know, my you know, girlfriend left me or, you know, I shot my foot. I mean, <laughs> sad songs, you know. <laughs> but there's so many songs that I was attracted to. Perhaps some of you may have been. Thought that's a beautiful love song. But what it is is about someone doing them wrong, you know? And and there that's what that's what love song was saying. So much of our music was sad. And I was talking to Marie, and this is like not disparaging today's music and all. I'm sure there's there's beautiful lyricists out there. I'm I'm sure of that. There has to be. Music is beautiful and so creative. But much of the music that young people that I've heard, the music they like, it isn't beautiful. It's angry. Much of the music is angry, and and it, and you wonder what 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 song uh, 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 somebody 25, 30 years old is going to get married to in their first dance? What song are they going to be dancing to? You know, you know, I hate your mama. I mean, what's the what, what what's the song? Boom, boom, boom. I, I I don't know. I don't know. But think of it for a minute, because uh, some of us in this room. You're aware of what I'm saying, and, and you may go home from church and turn on the radio as you're going, and if you listen to some songs, a lot of them are negative, a lot of them are sad, a lot of them are angry, and, you know, talk down on people and women and all of that. That's the truth. That's what happens. And that's, that's, what, we were, that's what we were set free from, you see, where he says so many of our songs were sad, and they were. So, you know, there's some old stupid songs about a guy who went to a, a dance, and he took a girl home, and and uh, and uh, she, he had her jacket, so he said, oh, I better go in, because he just met her at the dance, and so he went to the house where she lived and knocked on the door, and the guy opens the door. He says, I have your daughter's jacket, and the guy looks and says, she died, you know, and then you read, oh, wow, well, you know, and that, those are the kind of songs I listen to. I'm thinking, yeah, the best thing that happened is my girlfriend could die. You know, I mean, that's, that's the way I thought. It's kind of crazy. But anyway, I'll move on. <laughs> Believers sing a new song. We sing a new song. Psalm 96, verse 1, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Psalm 149, verse 1, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord, a new song and his praise in the assembly of saints. Well, they have their song, the song of the redeemed. Those who had come out of the tribulation had survived. God had protected them. They have a unique song that they sing. And they sing, verse 3 says, before the throne, the living creatures and the elders. It's a song no one else can sing, only the 144,000. They were saved after the rapture. They were saved during the tribulation and are unique in that. They'd gone through earth's greatest testing, persecution, and had been preserved. They'd been protected from pain and death. And they have a unique understanding. Now notice in verse 4, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God, and to the Lamb. So when it says these are the ones in verse 4 who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins, there are various ways commentators will explain this, this particular verse. 
when it says the, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, some will say that in the tribulation, these do not marry. They remain undistracted. You see in 1 Corinthians 7 that uh, Paul in verses 34 and 35 writes, an unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way, in undivided devotion to the Lord. So anybody here who is married knows that marriage is a distraction. Paul was simply saying that if she's unmarried, that she should remain that way because she can serve God without distraction. Many years ago, I was having a Wednesday night Bible study, and uh, after the study, a group of young people uh, came up to me afterwards, and they walked up to me, and they said, uh, Pastor, you want to come with us for some coffee? And I looked at them, and I said, I'm married. I I'm not allowed to have fun anymore. No, I'm married. <laughs> I said, don't you see this? Look down, there's a chain. <laughs> but I really, I teased with him, but I did say, I said, I said, boys, I said, I'm married. I said, it's not as if I wouldn't like to. I'd love to. I'd love to sit down with you guys and have a cup. I said, but, you know, I got a woman at home, and, and she's expecting me to come home tonight, you know, early, because I still have the wash, and I have to do the dishes, and I got a vacuum, got things to do. I said, I'm married, man. I said, I'd love to. And, and that's true. I mean, for you guys, too, if you're married, you know what, what it is. I mean, no, I've got another priority now. As much as I'd like to enjoy myself, I'm not single. I'm not unattached, right? So part of it, some are saying, could be that, that uh, they remain unmarried so that they're undistracted. There's another way. Uh, it could be that it says that their, their doctrine, the things they believe about God, is uh, undefiled. They're, they're people who didn't follow Antichrist. They have remained spiritually free from his false religion. And so there are those who say that when it speaks in that way concerning them, that they haven't been de defiled, they're virgins. There are those who say this would be speaking in, in a way of how they are just pure from from bad doctrine. And then three, uh, they are morally pure. They live undefiled or moral lives because the word virgin also speaks of purity or chastity. So in a culture that is promiscuous, in a culture that they're living in that is filled with what is called today recreational sex, these have remained pure. They remain morally pure and undefiled in the midst of an impure and decadent world. I lean in that direction, I believe, because when a person gets married, they're not defiled because the marriage bed is, is holy. And those who are married and enter into um, sexual activity with their wife or husband, that's ordained by God, ordered by God, and thus is blessed by God. So I lean in the direction that they live a morally pure life. They're undefiled, and they've remained pure morally as well as obviously not giving in to anything that would take them away from the Lord. So by way of application, believers cannot be both a friend of God and a friend of the world. You have to make a choice. A believer cannot be a friend of God and a friend of a world system that opposes him. When James was writing about this in chapter 4, verse 4, he said, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God simultaneously because the world system opposes all that God presents. 
My wife, Marie, when I married her, I didn't marry her for a part-time wife. When we were getting married and we were doing our, our vows, she didn't say, I promise to be faithful to you on uh, Saturday and Sunday. But Monday through Friday, that's my time. And I'm going to go with my friends and do whatever I want. Now, if Marie would have said that to me, I promise to be faithful two out of seven days of the week, obviously it wouldn't be uh, something I wanted to connect with. Why would I? Because I didn't ask her to give me a part of her heart. I asked her to love me with all of it. All of the heart that belongs to me, I want that. And I, in turn, will give to you all of the love I should give to you as my wife. I didn't say, you know what, I'll be your husband until I see somebody else that I'm interested in. And don't worry, I won't leave you. I'll just be with her for a little while. I didn't do that because that is adultery. And the Bible says it very clearly. And here's where the church, I think, has fallen asleep, if I may. The church has fallen asleep because there are quite a number of people that I encounter and I read some of the posts that they, they have on social media and all, and it shows that, that their faith in God is not a faith that is rooted in Scripture at all. It's rooted in emotion or sentiment or the way they were raised, but it's not speaking about a love and a loyalty to God that they would do anything for Him and serve Him with all of their heart. And God says, I don't want a part of your heart. I don't want a part of you. It's like if I have a house and I say, Lord, you can have every room except this closet in this closet. That's, uh, those are my, that's my hobbies. Those are the things I like. They belong to me. But I'll give you every room. I'll give you the kitchen, the bathroom, bedrooms, everything. But I want this closet. This closet belongs to me. I want it to have my reading material. I want it to have the things I enjoy doing. This closet's mine. The house is yours. The closet is mine. But Jesus would say, I don't want all the house without the closet. I want the whole house. And that's how you are with Christ. It's not, I didn't give him a part of my life. I didn't come to him and say, I will follow you with some of my life. I said, I will lay down my life. I will pick up my cross daily. I will follow you forever. And I will enter into the kingdom of God because you have paved the way and I followed you in. And that's how these people are. They're 100% followers of the Lord. They love him and they follow him. Notice wherever he goes, because they are fully committed to Christ. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices sacrifices. God is not receiving dead offerings. He receives living offerings. Offer your body. It's your spiritual act of worship and no longer com conforming to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Christianity. And that's what God has called us. And that's what these people are doing. In verse four, he says, these were redeemed from among men. Notice being first fruits of God and to the lamb. First fruit speaks of the first part of a crop. It was given as an offering to God in Deuteronomy 26. And the offering is intended to be set apart for divine service according to Deuteronomy 18. So the 144,000 are Jewish evangelists. They serve the Lord as his witnesses. And by calling them first fruits, they're used to represent many others who will be saved. They are what is called the first fruits of the redeemed of Israel. They foreshadow Israel's salvation. In Zechariah 12, verse 10, it says, They will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. So here the 144,000 are the first fruits of those to be saved during the tribulation. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9 says, in the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver, test them like gold. They will call on my name. I will answer them. I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is our God. In verse 5, And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. 
they do not preach Satan's propaganda. They only speak God's truth. You see, at a time when the world is pursuing false miracles, false prophets, and a false message, they speak truth. They're not going to water down God's word. They're going to preach it in truth and correctly. We're living in a day that is, I believe, leading up to a time when the apostasy does come in full bore, where pastors have transformed their churches into entertainment centers, where the pastor becomes the main entertainer, where the worship team becomes the band that provides entertainment, where the stage is used as a place to show their entertainment, and where the sanctuary becomes a theater and the people there become the audience. And I see many churches like this without trying to speak disparagingly against the church itself, but, but it's true and it's a fact that, that have ceased preaching a gospel. Why? Because many people, some of you may be aware of this, maybe some watching right now, maybe of, of this sort at the moment, but many people don't want to hear what the Bible actually says. They want to hear what makes them feel good about themselves. And so when the pastor says something that's uncomfortable, they want to shoot the messenger. How come you said this? Why do you, you don't have any love? That is so what we have today as a society. You know, I was sharing with you about this, that the emotionality, you know, that people can have, the feeling that the message doesn't make me feel good, that kind of thing. Well, these men, these evangelists, they were not concerned with scratching, itching ears. They were concerned about honoring God. And then they preached the word in truth. And they did it because they're without fault before the throne of God. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So they're going to continue to speak the truth. They do so in love. Like it says in Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. That's what they do. They speak the truth in love. And they tell the truth. They do it because they're without fault. They're sincere in their faith. They live a life that's free of accusation and reproach. It's not because they're good and pure by their own efforts, by the way. It, it, it's because God is at work in them. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You, say, you see, today when a Christian isn't perfect, well, there are those who will be immediately calling them a hypocrite. A hypocrite is, a, a far different, is far different than a, a person who on occasion acts improperly. You're not a hypocrite when you fail because we all fall short of the glory of God. You're a hypocrite when you're only plain as if you're a Christian. We all sin. But the difference with the hypocrite is he's putting on, she's putting on the appearance of being a believer when in fact she's not. The word hypocrite is actually a Greek word that speaks about the actors and the masks that they used to wear. It was the hypocrite, the actor. And so somebody is a hypocrite who is pretending to be something that they're not. But a believer is imperfect. You know it, I know it. God doesn't give me permission to continue in sin and to use grace as an excuse. He said, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who have been set free from sin live any longer therein, Paul says. So no, we are, not, we are not people who are using the grace of God as an excuse to continue in sin. No, but we do fail. We do. We do sin. We, we do make mistakes. We do do things that are wrong. And the Lord understands that. And, and God gives to us his mercy and his grace. But if I was pretending to be a believer, if I was pretending, then I'm a hypocrite. I'm only acting out a part, but I'm not really that at all. So you're not a hypocrite when you fail. I know that sometimes you think, I'm just a hypocrite. Well, maybe you are. I don't know. But maybe you're not. Maybe what you are is somebody who's falling short of the glory of God. One of the things I learned a long time ago is when I fall, try and fall forward. Try and 
get up and go forward, which is what I've been doing now for 50 years, because I'm not perfect, none of us are, but God is merciful. But I don't take his mercy as permission to continue doing something that he's not pleased with. While these people remain completely aloof from the doctrine of the false prophet, and by remaining faithful to God and desiring to conform to his word, they live properly. Ephesians 1.4 says, He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And in 1 Thessalonians 2.11 and 12, Paul said, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, you should walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Some things that you have done in life take a long time to forget, and sometimes you might remember at a time that you're under pressure. This last week, on Monday, I observed the anniversary of my father's going to be with Jesus when my father died. And, and he was in the hospital here in Chino. And uh, my mom and I and my wife and some of us, my family, were inside the waiting room. And um, he had a heart attack. And I was standing next to my mom and we heard over the uh, speaker, we heard the words uh, code blue. And my mama looks up at me and she says, that's for your daddy. And I said, yeah, I know, mama. And so within five minutes or so, you know, after that, we were notified. So when we heard that, the doctor came into the room and he called for our family, Rosales family. And I was there, I was the spokesman for the family. And I said, we're right here. And he says that those words that some of you have heard when a doctor says, we tried our hardest, we did our best, I'm sorry, that kind of thing. Those words, I, I confess, kind of floated past me. I wasn't really listening. I already knew what he was going to tell me. So he said we did our best. And I remember looking at the doctor and thanking him for doing his best. He said, if you want to see your father and husband, then you're free to go in now and pay your last respects. So we took, I took my mama's hands and Marie and our family, and we held hands there in that waiting room. And I thanked God for a father that was good to my, my mom and good to me. And we went in. And I stood there next to the, the, the bed that my dad was on. And, and I stood next to him where his body was. I stood next to his head. Mama was next to me. And I said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And my mother said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I reached down and I touched my father for the last time while he was still warm. And I touched my dad's head and I rubbed his head. And I said to him this, Daddy, I said, I, I dishonored your name. As a, as a young man, and I brought shame to you. I'm so sorry. And then I went on to say, but God saved me. And I hope that in your last days, I gave you reason to be proud of me. Why'd that come out? Why'd I say that? I, I've been teaching the Bible a long time. I know my father's in heaven. I know all of that. It's because deep inside, I could still feel the remorse, the pain of failure. And I had to remind myself in the Lord that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But you can carry that inside of you. See, in my family, and I'll close with this, my mama had tried to teach us to walk worthy of my father. She said, your father's name is respected. Do nothing 
to bring dishonor to it. Mama had poured that into me before I was 10 years of age. Your father is respected. Do nothing to bring dishonor to his name. And inside of me, all those years, I still felt sorrow over not being the man I should have been. And so I brought that into my Christian life, not the guilt that God finally did help me to overcome, but I don't want to bring dishonor to the name of the Lord. I want to walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I want to live as one of God's sons so that when people look at me, they can say, you're like your father. Speaking of my heavenly father, which is another way of saying you've become a godly man. And my friend Harold, who was just with me right now, just before he left, this is my friend, and this is how friends can talk to you sometimes. He looks at me and he says, David, I'm proud of you. Like, gee, thank you, Daddy, but I, I'm proud of you, which means a lot to me because he knew me, what I was, and he saw me today for what I've become. Walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Walk in such a way that the gospel is honored. Walk in such a way that your heavenly Father's name is not brought into disrepute because his child is acting in this fashion. Walk in such a way that people can say, you have been born again, haven't you? There's something different about you. What is it? And you can say, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was going to hell, but now I'm going to heaven. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm different. God has changed me. And even your closest friends can see that. Even your closest friends can say, I can see that. Something has happened in you. May we walk in such a way. And these who are there singing the song that God gave to them, they were undefiled, are singing a special song of praise because God has been with them. We have our own song that we can sing, and may it be one of praise because God has forgiven us.